Hi there, welcome to I Should Be Writing the Podcast for Wannabe Fiction Writers. I'm your host, Murr, and this is a car podcast, because I'm having to do a lot of stuff this week, and I really wanted to get this out because the concept was fresh in my head. Essentially, we're dealing with, um... It's the middle of NaNoWriMo. I'm trying to do a daily podcast for my Patreon supporters. If you want to support on Patreon for even just a dollar a month, you will get the daily podcast. They're short, but they're fun, and they give a little bit of NaNoWriMo advice every day. So I'm doing that. I'm trying to do NaNoWriMo. At this point, I'm about one day behind in word count, which is not bad for me. So I'm still feeling pretty confident. I'm traveling this weekend, which I'm seeing as worrisome because there's a day that I probably won't get any writing done. But there are two plane flights in there. And so if I can manage to not be distracted by the new Pokemon that's coming out, I could probably get some good words done. This episode, I have an uh, interview with Jacob Sabre. This episode, I have an interview with Jacob Sager Weinstein, and he was a lot of fun to talk to, and I got a lot of really good stuff in this interview. I can't wait for you guys to hear it. But I had, um, I was reading Runner's World the other day, and I'll, I'll just be honest, I, I read runner's world in hopes that it will encourage me to pick up running again um not running right now but still want to in theory as i sit in my warm little house but there was a column about a man pushing his uh son to join the cross-country team and the son is the kind of athlete that does the short bursts of effort basketball And the kid's like, I'm not going to be a good runner. And the dad's like, that's okay. That's kind of why I want you to do this. And I was kind of struck by that. And I realized that I always tell you guys that it's okay to write poorly. It's okay to suck. But I never really talk about why. Yeah, I mean, it's good to not worry about your inner editor and just let your words go, but there's more to it than that. First, and this sounds like humble bragging, and I'll just put that out there, um, I was the kind of kid that I was smart and did things well, and if I didn't, I figured they were too hard to worry about. It's like, that's the, I, I was reading a child psychologist, that's the downside of telling kids they're smart, because you're sort of telling them that, what they're encountering is easy for them, and it's like, it's a gift. And effort has nothing to do with it. So if there's something co- comes up that actually means they need effort, um, they're going to think, oh, it's too hard, it's not worth it. And that's sad. But that's what happened to me. I would If I encountered any sort of roadblock. I would just think, okay, well, my talent can't get through this, so never mind. And that's one of the reasons I took, like, ten years off of writing. So, when you try something new that you fully expect to be bad at, you're approaching it with a sense of humility. You're not approaching it with a pessimistic, oh, I'm going to suck at this. It's, I'm a beginner, and I'm going to have to go through all the things beginners go through in order to excel at this. And if you approach it with a sense of humility and that sense of freedom, that it doesn't matter what you write. Because the point is to get better. Then you might approach it without as much fear or a much expectation of yourself.
When I was about to go to Viable Paradise, I attended the week-long workshop in uh, 2006. God, that was a long time ago. Um, I decided to prepare for it by reading the memoir and writer book, writer writing book, uh, done by the woman who started Clarion, which is, if you're a science fiction writer, you probably know it's a six-week intensive workshop in the middle of the summer. And a whole lot of famous people have gone through Clarion. And others have gone through the smaller number, but still a lot of really amazing people have gone through Bible Paradise, including uh, John Chu, who won the Hugo a couple of years ago for a short story. He was in my year. So, but I went to, I read, I read Kate Wilhelm's book, and it's called Storyteller. I highly recommend it. It's just a thin little read. talks about writing, but it also talks about the beginning of Clarion, and it talks about writers' egos and how many people approach these workshops not wanting to be critiqued, but instead wanting to be validated. They don't want to be told how they can improve. They want someone to pat them on the head and say, you're a good writer. And, you know, I was very myopic and thought, okay, well, then I won't do that. So I was utterly shocked when somebody at our workshop did exactly that. She was a middle-aged businesswoman who had essentially, you know, climbed the business ladder, broken the glass ceiling, achieved a whole lot, and now she wanted to be a writer. And she figured since she'd climbed up this one ladder, she could just leap across to the writing ladder and stay on the same rung. And she wouldn't accept it when the teachers are like, no, you're a beginner. you got to start at the bottom. She got so mad, she left early. And I don't, it, it's, see, the thing is, this is what baffles me. The workshop is on Martha's Vineyard. So to, to get away, to leave early, to leave a vacation or a workshop on Martha's Vineyard early is really expensive. Because you either have to buy an extraordinarily expensive plane ticket on short notice just to get off the island. Or I guess you could take the ferry and then... But still, changing changing any flight is is insane. And, you know, the ferry ride is no picnic. So, oh, and also the super fast ferry had stopped running. So... She only had the flight, an extraordinarily expensive flight, or a uh, super slow ferry. And I guess that's what baffled me. Her, her hubris was so huge that not only did she leave this workshop that was giving her so much opportunity and, and information and would show her which way she needed to go to grow... But she spent a lot of money to get off the island. I mean, that's like, that's like paying to be a jerk. She paid for the honor to be a big jerk. So, she was somebody who could not accept the fact that there's a learning curve. And that wherever you're writing is probably where you need to be. Because if you're not writing and you think you're very bad, then you're going to be writing at a level where you're a beginner. And if you are writing, then you're getting better, although you probably can't tell, even though it's happening. It's really hard to look at your own writing and see improvements, because you're in, it's like, you know, judging the water you're in is when you're a fish. Somebody says that metaphor better than I do, but you get the idea. You want to allow yourself to write poorly. You want to allow yourself room to work hard and room to learn. If you think yourself so talented that you're going to hit it, you know, hit a home run the first time, 
You're not, you're never going to learn how to strike out. You know, I, I talk about this in my uh, book, I Should Be Writing, where if you've got somebody who's starts out with great talent and, like, sells her first short story, sells her second short story, and then her third short story gets rejected, and then she's like, oh, well, clearly I've reached as good as I'll ever get, and I'll stop. Whereas if you've got somebody who gets rejected, gets rejected, gets rejected, gets rejected, they understand that rejection's part of the game. So they'll get rejected, get rejected, get rejected, have a sale, be over the moon about it, but know that the next story they send out, probably going to get rejected a couple of times. So there's my metaphor for the day. You need to learn how to strike out before you learn how to make a home run. And now we will get to the Jacob Sager Weinstein interview. Welcome back to I Should Be Writing. I am here with Jacob Sager Weinstein, the author of the middle grade novel Hyacinth and the Secrets Beneath. How are you, Jacob? I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. You have... This is a fascinating looking book. This is... uh. There, there are a lot of, lot of elements to this book, I guess you could say. Uh, before we get to the uh, intelligent pig, um, why don't we go s- to the broad view of what your book is about? Sure. Uh, so um, as a, a matter of, of actual fact, uh, I did not make this part up, there are a number of rivers running beneath the city of London, um, under the streets, beneath buildings. And if you read the history books, They'll tell you they were buried underground for boring reasons having to do with sanitation and public works. Um, But the truth, as my book reveals, is that these are powerful, magical rivers, and they had to be buried to uh, protect public safety. Um, And so my book is about a young American girl named Hyacinth, who is uh, sort of forcibly moved to London by her mom and accidentally unleashes the power of one of these rivers uh, and has to find a magically charged drop of water that is lost somewhere in London sewers in order to prevent a, uh, a magical catastrophe. So without spoiling, how does one look for a drop of water? Uh, well, I guess I would say if you if you lost it if, it, if it ran away because of magic, you find it using magic. Uh-huh. Uh, so so she has, this being London, she, she ends up with a, uh, an enchanted umbrella uh, that, that sort of helps her in that part of her quest. Excellent. So this this is a super fun book. Also has mosquitoes in tuxedos. Um, yes, a vital vital uh, thing to have in any book. So there are so many myths about London, and it's just so much history, so much myth. How much of this did you make up, or are mosquitoes and tuxedos part of the London myth that I just don't know about because I'm an American? <laughs> uh, the mosquito. So so you've zoomed in actually on one of the few things that is not. A London myth. I'd say about 90% of the stuff in this book is in some sense based on reality, although obviously with a weird magical twist to it. Um, the mosquitoes and tuxedos, I think that came from something I saw in California, which is it's like an old fashioned uh, exterminator. And it's a picture of like a guy with a big nose and a tuxedo holding a mallet. And somehow that warped into a mosquito in my mind. But but the other stuff is is very London based. Cool. How much uh, research did you have to do to prepare for this book? Uh, I did a ton. So it took me sort of depending on how you measure it, about eight to ten years to write book one in the series, uh, and then books two and three I, I wrote in one year each. And that's because that first eight to ten years, a lot of that was spent researching. And I'm sort of I'm sitting in my office as we talk. And I'm looking over at my bookshelf, and they're just packed with books on London, uh, which I, I pillaged freely uh, to make my story. So this is a question um, I'm asking from a point of view of being a writer for adults, because I, I think a lot of people think that writing for kids is somehow easier or you get a freer pass. But um, what is the importance of doing such intricate research for kids who probably on the surface won't care or pay attention that closely to the historical accuracy. Ooh. So, well, I would say that I think that a, a crucial thing in fantasy for children, just as it is for adults is creating a world that feels real. And I would say 90 to 99% of the stuff that I researched, um, 
never really makes it into the book directly. That that stuff feeds into backstory, and even the backstory doesn't make it into my book. But uh, the analogy I would use is that doing all this research for a fantasy writer, for grown-ups or for children, is like studying anatomy for a painter, where even if you're not showing the skeleton and the muscles, they're lurking beneath the surface and making what you do show feel like it's alive and solid. And Ooh. I think that's just as, yeah, and I think kids will pick up on the lack of that just as much grown up, as grown-ups will. I really love that analogy. I usually use it as a, sort of a foundation of the house. That's how I usually yeah. think about it because I'm having a disagreement with somebody about how if we want the reader to be confused by something, it's cool that the writer doesn't know what the thing is. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, no, no. The writer needs to know what's going on even if we want the reader to be confused about it. But uh, You are 100% right. Yeah, but I like the anatomy uh, description. That's that's pretty good. You're not you're not writing about all the gushy parts and the skeleton, but uh, you need to know it's there. That's exactly right. Because otherwise, my, my rough. Oh. No, go ahead. I was going to say my general policy is I don't have to answer every question I ask in the book, but I should at least know what the answer is. Yes. So you didn't just spend the last 10 years working on this one project. You've had an actually interesting career. Tell me about what else you've been doing in those 10 years. Uh, so uh, let's see. Going back those 10 years, I've done – well, so I, in some ways I describe myself as an accidental children's author in that the, the first few books I wrote uh, I thought were for grown-ups. So my, my first three books were uh, The Government Manual for New Wizards, the government manual for new superheroes and the government manual for new pirates. Uh, and I wrote those with a friend of mine uh, named Matthew Bozik. And we thought we were writing for sort of very sophisticated grownups. And uh, I kept kept meeting people who say, oh, I've got your book. My 10 year old loves it. Um, <laughs> so that, yeah. So I sort of realized that I could write like the smartest possible thing that I was capable of. And it would be at exactly the right level for like today's 10 year olds. Um, but so, I mean, there, there is a, I think one of the advantages of that, of coming into children's books, is that it does mean that I'm, I never write down. I really do try to write the smartest stuff I can, and I think kids appreciate that. Um, but so I wrote those books. Uh, then I wrote a book called uh, How Not to Kill Your Baby, which is a parody of pregnancy and parenting books. Uh, and I wrote that shortly after my first kid, my daughter, was born, when I had been reading a whole lot of the actual serious pregnancy and parenting books and just thought they were ripe for satire. Mm -hmm. um, and so sort of while that was going on, I was also trying to do, trying to sort of break in as a movie writer and director. Um, and I, I made some inroads, I got some commissions for scripts, but nothing ever got made. Uh, and at a certain point, I just decided I was having, having better luck with, with the prose, with the prints, and decided to really devote myself to that full time. Um, and that's about the time that, uh, that my daughter was born. Um, and I just finished this, this parody and I was, even though she was too young, of course, to read just after she was born, I was returning to, to classic children's books. People were giving us picture books as gifts. And I started remembering how much I loved the best children's books I had grown up with, uh, and how good they were and how, how I started realizing how high, uh, a target that was to aim for and and really sort of devoting myself to focusing on that. Excellent. So you've you've given the Hollywood thing a try and and man that's a that's a cutthroat town. And by yeah. town I mean just film and movies and uh, movies and TV in general, but Yes, absolutely. And I actually I worked for I was a writer on a TV show oh gosh, at this point like 15 years ago. Uh, and that was, that was really fun and exciting, but that's, uh, that is, I think at this point in my past. Yeah. Um, so having gone through several different, uh, writing for kids, writing for adults, when you, writing for kids, when you think you're writing for adults and yes. <laughs> going for scripts, um, I, I'm hoping you have a lot of insight to give to our beginning writer audience. In any, uh, I, any one of those realms. Ooh, tell, tell me some uh, things you've learned. Okay. Well, I would say um, I think the biggest thing I've learned is that – I was going to say is is that – I was going to put this in the, in the second person. If I say is, is the biggest thing I've learned is that you will probably stink when you start off. But let me put that in the first person. I certainly stink when I start off, started off. Um, and I think it's just important to just get those bad first drafts out of the way. Um so uh, keep writing is, is one bit of advice. 
don't get too hung up on any one project. I think, especially when you're starting off, if you're writing and rewriting a project, you'll probably get it to the point where it's as good as you can make it at that stage in your development, but it's still not quite good enough to get you the agent or the publisher or, or whatever it is you're looking for that you want. Um, and there's sometimes the best thing to do is to go on to the new project and just rethink things from the ground up. Okay, let's 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 mind that a little bit because yes. I think that's one of the most important pieces of advice, but it, it hurts my heart to say it because I know people who've worked on projects and not really developed a project, but more spun their wheels trying to learn on the same yes. project for years and years and years. And I I want to not crush their souls, but I'm trying to figure <laughs> out how to say, move on. So, yeah, so what, what's your per perspective on that when there's just this thing that you know could be great if you could just fix it a little bit more? That's, it's, it's a hard thing to give a universal rule. And, and by the way, as I was giving that advice, I was thinking about what I just told you earlier, which is that I spent eight to 10 years on my, my first uh, kid's book, and it wasn't all research. There was a lot of writing and rewriting there, and, and probably at a certain point, the same thing would have been for me to give it up after you know six years, but I didn't, and it got published. So, so I don't know how I, it's, so what, what is the difference? And I guess I would say the difference is that for, for that whole time, I, I always knew what I needed to do to make it better, or I kept finding it out, that I would write a draft, I would think it was brilliant and perfect. I'd give it to a friend and I'd get their feedback. And based on their feedback, I'd know what needed to happen to make it better. Um, and I think as long as you really know that, if you have like a specific thing that you are trying to fix, I don't think you're crazy for trying to fix it. But you know, at one point I wanted to write TV sitcoms. And I think the moment where I knew that wasn't the right thing for me was somebody showed me a sitcom script uh, a spec script that was written by an aspiring writer that was being passed around town as an example of this is amazing, this is great, this is what you should strive for. And I could not see the difference between what I was writing, which mm -hmm. wasn't getting attention, and this great thing that was. And I think sometimes the lesson people draw is, well, people are idiots, I'm a genius, and nobody knows. But I think <laughs> the, the better lesson, which is what I do, is, okay, this is just, if I can't see it, I probably should be trying something different. And I felt like the whole time I was writing and rewriting my book, if you showed me, you know, Harry Potter and my book, I could tell you what J.K. Rowling was doing a million times better than me. And I'm, I'm still clearly, I, I don't want to, I nowhere near that. But I feel like I, I even to this day, I can sort of look at people who are better than me and know what I, I need to do or know what's the difference between me and them is. That's a really good point. Um, that's one of the reasons why I dropped out of journalism school was because I was taking an ethics journalism law and ethics course and I it was a very important um class for my major and I felt like I nailed every test and I was getting C's and D's mm, and I mm -hmm. did not know why it's like you know sometimes you know you don't know the answer to something I knew those answers I knew them backwards and forwards and and since I could not even comprehend what I didn't know I realized it wasn't for me but um, that's a, a, another thing is, where were you in your career when you started this book or when you started wanting to write this book? Um, I was sort of, I was, I was, I, I was in what I probably thought was a low point, although I, I got lower still afterwards. No, um, I'm sorry. I, I mean, where but, like you were already a writer, you were already yes, a pro yeah. writer writing for money for publishing things. That's it. That's absolutely right. And I'd written a bunch of I'd written a bunch of scripts. I had written. Uh, uh, I think this was. I think when I started on this book, I think my fourth published book had already came out. But maybe it was only the third. But it was around then. Mm -hmm. Well, the the other thing um, I like the being able to compare and contrast what you your stuff versus the bestseller. But another thing you didn't mention was beginners. They they will often fall in love with one idea and not look any. They will be monogamous with that idea. Yes. And they will think I will write something else once I am done with this idea. While a pro will, you know, go to it, leave it, come back, work on something else. Know that if they need to dump it, they can. Um. You know, I I, I worry that someone's going to bring up the fact that um I think Neil Gaiman conceived the graveyard book when his son was like four, riding a mm -hmm. tricycle around a London graveyard. His son's an adult now. 
And it took him, you know, he decided he wasn't ready to write that book, but it just stayed in the back of his mind for decades. And then he finally wrote it and won all the awards and all that stuff. But, um, you know, he was already a pro. He already knew that which which ideas needed to just sit in the back, which ideas needed to um, be worked on and which need to be thrown out. And that's something that comes with experience. And, you know, you could always come back to something. You, you don't have to throw it away forever. But anyway. Yeah, I, I think that's great. And actually, you saying that, uh, uh, made me think of something that is the answer I, I should have given you when you asked just sort of what is the general thing I've learned from all my experiences so do you mind if I if I Please. jump back and tell you that now so um, with the TV show I was working for was a comedy variety show um, meaning that that I was not writing stories we were just writing jokes mm-hmm. um, and so each week it was a it was a half hour weekly show um, and each week for that half hour just for the 10 minute monologue I would probably write about a hundred jokes that I would submit. Um, there were roughly ten writers, so that's about a thousand jokes a week being written for those ten minutes, Whoa. of which about ten would get on the air. So literally ninety percent of what I wrote was gone. And because we were making jokes about current events, it's not like I could sort of put aside my Bill Clinton joke and come back to it ten years mm-hmm. later. Like it was just yeah, I just had to throw it away. And I feel like as painful as that was, that was probably the best thing, one of the best things I've ever learned in writing was just that you write something and that what what you have to offer as a writer is not any one sentence you've written, it's your ability to keep writing new sentences. Um, and to this day, I'm pretty merciless about just throwing out anything that I think does not work. Wow, that's some sobering but really awesome wisdom you just threw down there. <laughs> that's well, a, no, it's, it's, it's true. It's, it's just, I... I think sometimes when I think about um, like animation, my daughter just did this, uh, an animation to an, a They Might Be Giant song and she finished it last night. And she's like, you're looking at three months of my life right here. And I'm like, welcome to animation. This stuff's not yeah. easy. <laughs> and I think a lot of people either, you know, sometimes turn away from creative stuff because they realize it's going to be really hard or they t- go from one to another thinking it's going to be easier. But like you just said, I guess I always thought writing was easier than animation, but probably because I'm not an artist. But still, just what you just said is just like, that's a lot of work that just doesn't get, you know, attention. And, and it certainly teaches you to, uh, it's got to teach you humility, doesn't it? Yeah, oh, it absolutely does. It absolutely does. Wow. Yeah, I, I I just worry about those uh sorry, I'm pausing here. Um what gets me about T V is that so much work will go into like a ten second sight gag. I, I, I was watching The Good Place and there's a scene where the character's got hundreds of needles in his face and his feet and I heard an interview with him, it like took eight hours to get him all set up for that scene and that scene oh took like 10 20 seconds and yeah. it was just a sight gag he shows up with these needles complains about the needles and then goes away and uh it just there's so much work that goes into this that you don't want to think about so let's say that uh we've scared some people uh-huh, and good. how can we get them to, go, to to how can we tell them that it's totally worth it uh, well, I would say that the, the, the upside to that terrifying idea of having, of that you should be willing to throw out anything you do or give up on anything you do is that, is that what you have to offer is you that I think it's very, if you put everything, all your belief and all your hopes in this story or this book, um, or this sentence, which people do sometimes, then you've taken that value away from yourself and put it on something whose fate you have less control over. So I think if you if you ha- come to a moment where you are despairing over something you've written, either because it's not as good as you want or because you think it's great but it's not getting attention, that book, that story, that script is not you. And if if you can get in that frame of mind, then then you can see that book or whatever it is as a sort of a step in your journey. The book's job is to bring you where you need to go. You don't exist to bring that book to the world, if that makes sense. Whoa. That's good stuff. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, so I'm trying to figure out, I'm, I'm, I'm brainstorming something really quick here, and I think you should go along with me on this crazy new scheme, which is how okay, can I we did. create like a boot camp for writers, not to make them be better writers, but to make them churn out a great deal of stuff and be okay with throwing it away. How can we do that? I think, well, I think, I, you know, I, I guess I sort of lucked into that boot camp yeah. my job. <laughs> I, I, you know, some advice I will sometimes give people if they're blocked or they're, you know, they just can't finish a draft or even get started is I will say put at the top of the page my crappy first draft. And I think somehow just looking at it that way as recognizing that anything you write, the first thing you write, it might be brilliant, but it's probably not and that's okay, I think can be incredibly liberating. Um, I've also found that for me, it helps to give myself objectively measurable goals. Like if you say my goal for today is to write one beautiful paragraph, you're driving, you'll drive yourself crazy. But oh, if your yeah. goal for today is just to get 300 words on paper, no matter how crappy they are, you can do that. And I feel like just, just doing that once and achieving that goal, I think it builds on itself. I think it's a virtuous cycle where you, you get that, that satisfaction of accomplishing your goal and then you can do it again and again. And eventually you have something that you can start revising and working with. Excellent. Um, so going back to your work, um, book one is already out. Is there, is there a title for the, uh, series itself? Uh, I guess it's the Hyacinth series, Okay. which is not, yeah. All right. So Hyacinth and the Secrets Beneath is already out. You said you finished the next two. When is book two coming out? So, uh, book two is coming out, uh, next year in, I think May of 2018. And that is Hyacinth and the Stone Thief. Uh, and if you if you look online uh, on wherever you go to look for books, you can actually see the cover for it, which is I think just as great as the cover for the first one. Um, and that one I'm I'm mostly done with. There's a little bit of editing to do. Book three, I've sort of I've what I found is that even even after you've gotten to this point where you sort of know what the series is and you've written the first book, I still had to write a really bad first draft of book two. Mm -hmm. And now it's at the good stage. I think book three, I've written my bad first draft. I've recently sent in my okay second draft to my editor and now my job is to sort of actually get that to an, an actually good and perhaps even great third draft mm -hmm. so what's uh do you have a plan on after the hyacinth books are you going to write more hyacinth books or are you going on to another project or are we waiting to see what the publishing gods de de determine uh mostly the last of those yeah. so i originally <laughs> thought of yes and and we are always at their mercy I, uh, I at one point I thought of Hyacinth as a, a six book series. Um, my agent thought correctly that a publisher wouldn't want to commit to more than three books up front. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't want to do that thing that happens more often in TV than in books where you, you really fall in love with the characters and the story and then it suddenly ends and you never find out what happens. So I. And I by you, you mean the reader? Yes. Yes, okay. that's right. Um, uh, and like I said, it doesn't usually happen in books unless the author dies, but it, it happens too often in TV. Um, so I, I structured it as two trilogies. So my hope is that when the reader gets to the end of book three, they'll feel like it's a satisfying ending. All their questions have been answered. But if the, the publishing gods grant me three more books, I've sort of I've left myself room to start asking new questions and going in new directions. Excellent. Oh, but I'm sorry to answer your question about what I'm working on. What's what's next? Is, yes, uh, I have. I also do picture books, so I have a picture book coming out next year. Uh, that I, I and and my part in that is mostly done, and it's just sort of in the hands of the illustrator. Um, and other than that, I'm just starting to pitch whatever the next middle grade book will be. Mm -hmm. So we will be giving away a copy of Hyacinth and the Secrets Beneath uh, to a lucky listener. So uh, you, one of your books will be going out. Um, glad to to pass that word along and is there anything else that you would like to say that I haven't asked you or any more nuggets of wisdom for new writers uh no I mean I I think the only thing I have to say is that is that whatever stage you are in your writing you're you're certainly no worse than I was at one point and you're probably much better <laughs> so so keep at it Excellent. All right. Where we, where can we find you online? Uh, the best place is probably Twitter. And I'm Jacob SW there. Uh, I also have a website, which is jacobsakerweinstein.com. But I am nowhere near as good at updating that as I probably should be. Yeah, I hear that. Me too. Yeah. But uh, thank you so much for being on the show and giving such awesome advice, Jacob. Oh, my pleasure. It's been great. Thank you for having me.
Thank you, Jacob. It was great having you on the show to give me your wisdom. I'm currently in the car. If I, if you can't tell, and I haven't been able to edit out the ambient noise um, because I'm just trying to get a lot of stuff done, and so I can't answer any emails right now. But I will have a feedback show coming up soon, and I hope Nanorama is going well for you. If you want to support me, there's a number of ways you can do it. You can support me by buying my books. I should be writing, and Six Wakes are the books I had out this year. I also had a short story in the Star Wars anthology from a certain point of view. And I'm one of the team that writes the ongoing serial Book Burners. First season available in hardcover and paperback, and the subsequent seasons available ebook and audiobook. Or, if you just want to be a fan of the podcast, you can... Support me by supporting the Patreon, patreon.com slash mightymer. That will give you the ability to just support, support and get a serial, support and get free books, support and get an open channel of communication for me that is answered a lot faster than I do feedback shows. So there are a lot of options. I have a new website. It is merverse.com. If you have any problems, let me know. Sorry, but that's finally up, and I'm so excited about it. And if you can't support me financially because it's the holidays and times are tough, or you don't want to, tell a friend. Tell a friend about the podcast. Tell a friend about the Patreon. Tell a friend about my books. Encourage your library to stock my books. That's a big help, too. You can do all of these things, or none of them, and still get to listen because it's a free show. So... Keep working on NaNoWriMo, or keep working on whatever you're working on, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. And until then, you should be writing. Remember, you can support the show at patreon.com slash I should be writing the theme music provided by John Anilio. You can find more about him at johnanilio.com. This podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike License. It's on TV tonight But I should